My name is Michael Krödel. I'm mainly teaching at the University of Rosenheim here. I have a chair for building automation and I'm simultaneously also running the Institute for Building Technology. What will happen next is I will promise you basic knowledge, solid data so that you can make a proper decision, decide if there is something that you find interesting if we're talking about smart building, this is something we will all have to deal with. That is a fact. So ultimately, you will have to come up to opinion whether you like it or not, whether you think it's good or not. And if there's something that you like about it that you might want to focus on. So I have some information for you and I promise you after the presentation, you have a sound basis for making a decision whether you like it or not. In fact, there is no right or wrong answer, right? Those who say that we have to automate are just as wrong as the one who say we don't need this technology, right? Just a very brief introduction on the slide. Once again, I'm at the uh, University for Applied Sciences in, Ro in uh, Rosenheim. This is the logo of our institute, right? So, and I also made a presentation available to download from the website. You can find the address on the slide. So if you click on the link or use the QR code, you can find the presentation as well as some additional information and documents. The link and the QR code are also available on the last slide. So if you're not ready to do that now, if you want to stick with me until the very end, then you will be once again awarded the link and the QR code if you want to download the material. But I mean, so far you don't know what is awaiting you. So let's get going. So this is uh, a visual that I just added last week when people ask me about automation. I'm going to make my actual point later on, but just this slide. So currently we're facing a huge political crisis, so and we must save energy. So we don't want to freeze to death last winter. We need to reduce our energy consumption, our energy demand. With building automation, you have a huge saving potential that you can tap into. So maybe 20% in the in-office building from a normal automation to a little bit more of a sophisticated automation. So it's not even that much. It's just a small leap. If you just lift it a little bit more to the next level, then you can save 20%. And why is this the case? I will show you in a minute. My message is not to automate everything, but maybe to also look at the trade of automation and not only at the other factors. Let's start with smart building. What is it and do I actually need it? So what's the best definition of building automation or rather automation in general? I think it was 10 years ago at Wikipedia, and it's this one. So you can read through it. It is automation is the transmission or the transfer of work um, from humans to automats or automation or automated machines. It sounds quite trivial, but I think it's the most important slide of my presentation because what it says here, or this sentence says, that once you automate it, you have less work than before as a human. So you can think of counter examples, of course. So maybe cases where automation really made you angry, gave you more work. So without automation, it was less complicated. So maybe there are cases where automation is the transfer of work from humans to automates realized with the help of machines doesn't apply. So sometimes you think, okay, just a normal manual push button would have been way easier than the automation. So there are many counter examples where this doesn't work. And if you know these examples, what I always say to those people telling me about them, well, those elements involved in automation, the sensors, the actuators, they're not responsible for that. They just told you, they just do what you told them to do. You program them. So you just assemble them and then you program them. This was all done by humans. And if you don't give them the right requirements, the right rules, the right calculus, if you will, then I mean, no wonder that they're not gonna, that they're not gonna work the way you want them to. So at this point, always, if you come up with counter examples, whether this is something that you want a good spirit to do for you. And if that's what you want, sketch that out, draft this as a possible automation, and then it works. Another, introductory slide to the presentation. So the house on Eaton Place, I don't know if some of you are familiar with that. I don't know how many young and old are here in the audience. This was a cult series. This in the 70s, everybody loved it on TV. 
So you had the family felony and they had so many servants and they were responsible for making sure that everybody, uh, that the house was well taken care of. If the masters weren't at home, then they saw them arriving from far away. So they opened the windows, they lit the candles. So they had a number of servants who just made sure that the family Bellamy was doing well. I'm not entirely sure how the case is with you today. So that the series was playing in the 1900s, that was the setting. So it ran on in the 70s, but the place of action was the 1900s. So and back then it was normal that a richer family had that many servants. So how many of you have people helping out around the house? Not that many, right? By show of hands at least. So maybe you have you uh, you have a vacuum, you have a dishwasher, but who is pulling up and down the blinds? Maybe you have a time control for that. But it would be great if you just left the house and then the blinds are closed. And when you're arriving or coming back home, they they rise up again. Or your windows are monitored if you're not home and you're notified if somebody tries to break in. And I mean, if you don't have uh, an entire football team of servants who is doing that job and maybe this is the point where you could start to think about the idea that maybe in earlier days those were servants tasks and now we can handle this with automation i will talk about the details and the technical terms in a minute but in fact let me just black out my screen if you think about smart home you get a lot of information and people telling you you need this and that forget all of that just think about one example imagine you were to live in the 1900s and you had this huge team of servants now think about that what would you tell your servants what they are supposed to do and when so take an empty piece of paper write that down and if you can't think of anything then you don't need smart home but if there's something for like, oh, it would be great if somebody could monitor the windows if I'm not home. So, and then you have the corresponding system installed. Or you say, okay, the window is open from the outside, from the exterior. So we have a presence notifier. So for every wish, I could provide you with a technical solution. But I would, to begin with, go away from the technology and just say, think about, okay, what would I tell my servants? So once again, empty piece of paper. And you cannot think of anything then you don't need automation. And if you can think of something, then you automate that and just that. I say that because there are many projects where people um, automate everything, want smart home for everything, then it's not working, and then people say, okay, it was so much better without. But that's not the fault of the technology. Right. Let's talk about the sub-areas, energy efficiency. This is a carpet plot. I don't know if you know what this is. You read it from left to right, the dates and the, on the um, x-axis and the hours on the y-axis. Maybe this was a, a pump, a heating pump in the basement or a ventilation, ventilation um, system in the room. So you can see it ran from 8 till 10 on Monday. Uh, Saturday and Sunday wasn't running at all. If this was an office building, maybe this was good. You had some ventilation throughout the week, but you didn't ventilate. Um, on the weekend. In the second week, things already change. And what can, what kind of lessons can we learn from this carpet plot? Because they have a really powerful statement. Is if something is out of the extraordinary, you would have to check, okay, why is it not working? And if it looks symmetrical, then everything's fine. And honestly, if the carpet plot was the carpet plot or reflecting your ventilation system in your office building. And this would be the real carpet plot reflecting your office building, your office room. Then somebody would say, okay, something's wrong. Every morning at eight o'clock and it stops right on the bang at 10 o'clock. Not earlier sometimes, not later sometimes. So, and this is basically what you can take away here. If you have those carpet plots, this can tell you that you have bad time control. And you could save much more energy if you would just operate your ventilation system on demand. So every time if air quality is bad, it is switched on and it is switched off once air quality is good again. And this is just the same with pumps in the basement, with, basement, with lighting. So every trade needs to be operated on demand and not time controlled. If that were your ventilation system, 
for the room that you're hopefully right now thinking about. And you would have a demand-based operation that the carpet plot would just look like a Swiss cheese with a lot of holes in it, right? I hope you can follow me there visually. So you have gaps, sometimes it started earlier, sometimes it stopped later. And if that is what you're getting, you can see at first glance, without being an expert in automation, great, I have a demand control system. And once again, those are the, the different options. You can save 20% of energy, and I will prove you in a minute why. And what do you need for that? Well, if it's ventilation, if it's about air quality, uh, then you just need a sensor for air quality. If it's about lighting, you need a lighting sensor. If it's a pumping system, you just need to have a certain monitoring of the circle of the pump. So if you have a demand-based uh, operation, then you can save a lot of energy. Another aspect is safety or security, of course. In private living, this is one of the main marketing drivers. So we're doing a lot of that for private buildings as well as uh, lighting. If you talk to people about smart home, they're like, ah, oh, I don't know, it might not work. I, I might not understand it. But if you talk about security, they listen up. So. I mean, you don't need to have an emergency call to the police department right away. But of course, you need to make sure that your windows are monitored properly. You need to register presence. You need to um, make sure that you have proper notification so that you, maybe you're notified if somebody is opening uh, a window onto terrace. You don't need to notify the police station right away. Maybe you just have an alarm system. So I have a smart home system. I have a window alarm, um, which is going on for five minutes. If somebody trying to open the window and my entire house is lit up for 50 minutes, I have some lighting sources outside so that you have those opportunity thieves that are, sh that are shying away from that. I mean, if you had the mob, that would want to enter your house, they would not be scared off by 15 minutes of lighting and uh, pomp and circumstances around my house. But I, where I live, this is enough. I live in a very down-to-earth residential area. There you have some people who are just looking for an opportunity, so they might be scared away from this system. So with a smart home system, you can prevent against breaking an entry. And then this also brings us to the facade area. I want to talk about the individual trades, of course. So, and then you can also talk about windows, about shading, and then safety, health and safety, convenience, comfort. So this is about mold trying to access the building and the gentleman is telling his wife, didn't you feed him enough? So facades are becoming ever more tight. Air permeability is dropping. You have, because you don't want to have any heat radiation uh, or outflow to the exterior, but you can also have a very easy sensor detection. You can have a moisture sensor and you know, okay, if we exceed 60% of humidity, then just switch on ventilation. Maybe um, you can do that manually ventilation or you can have a proper ventilation system or you can just tilt your window open to have a little bit of fresh air and everybody needs to know whether they want to address this or not. Right, this brings me to my next little tip. How do you get started? So. At the University of uh, Rosenheim, we did two, conducted two large studies. And we were, were asking what is alluring for people? For what would they be willing to pay with regard to smart home? And the highlights, we collected and transported them in a door hanger. Maybe you can try to read that yourself. So we could see there was the, the highlights. First one, I want to save energy because there's too much heating and lighting. Then also that you can control your windows while you're not at home. You want, the second point was to have a switch where you can switch off everything to avoid standby losses. Additional safety is point three. So to deter uh, any people who would like to break in. Um, then also blind control, then light scenes, second to last, uh, switches where you need them, not only on the wall, and then intuitive and simple operations. So those are the highlights out of two studies where a lot of people were asked what they wish for in smart home. And everything is feasible. I mean, I have an entire questionnaire. I have so many more that you could answer, but they, these are the highlights and the message looking at the slide is the following. If you read through those highlights, and this is not appealing to you, then you don't need the extended questionnaire. You know that smart home is not for you. There's also a very sound insight, right? If there is something that you find interesting, then you have two options. You can say, okay, I do that and not more, and I promise you it will be affordable, 
stable and you will be happy with that solution every day. So maybe it's not about, or it is about doing not too much. Just stick with what you want. If you actually want to do more, then I have the extended questionnaire. We can talk about that in a minute, 48 questions. And there are just seven questions about shading and five questions about safety and security. And then we can work through that. So maybe there are additional things that you might like. And also what's very important about this questionnaire at the end, and this was very important to us, we have one page, which is the Joker page, the empty spaces, empty fields where you can enter what you think is relevant. So we have only very straightforward questions and nothing that is completely uh, unreal or spaced out. So we don't say, while I'm in the supermarket, I would like to be able to check the content of my fridge. Things like, things like that would, were dropped from the study. We just have very straightforward, realistic options. So you can use this questionnaire to really determine whether there's something for you, that there's something in it for you in Smart Home. And before you've done so, please do not decide for or against the Smart Home system. So don't let any manufacturer tell you their Smart Home system is the best and you don't know what you actually want. And I would, on like in the same vein, not decide against Smart Home because it's just too much that you don't need and it's actually superfluous. Read the questionnaire, maybe there's something that you might like. If there's nothing, you can still decide against it. Right. So the door hanger also has a back side. On the back side, you can say, I don't want anything. I might do without everything. But then there is a list of the things that you would have to do yourself every day. It is a little bit exaggerated. Everything is red. The people look sad in the visual on the door hanger. So we try to make it a little bit fun. But the serious message is, if there is nothing for you here on the green side, then maybe just try to consciously decide against smart home and become aware of what this would mean for you. And what I would like you to invite uh, you to do is to really consider all these options, to really cross off all these things of the list that you might like, and then decide against it. So in psychology, often, if you actually are presented with all the options that you're missing out on, then you suddenly understand this is much a much more targeted approach than just being presented with all the options that you could have. A couple of decades ago, there was a study conducted in the US and they found out that humans feel lost more than they appreciate a win. So sometimes you have to tell the people what they will not get. So, I mean, this is just like arm wrestling, right? If I tell you, okay, smart home is great, and you say, I don't want to, then we're in, at an impasse, right? But if I tell you what you will not have, if you decide against it, this might be interesting. So as I said, we had those two um, visual aids, and we extended then our questionnaire to the smart home pocket planner. I will distribute that later on, or put it somewhere where you can take it if you want. So here you can rip up the questionnaire card. Once again, the green and the red side, front and back side. And what's important, let's imagine somebody is ticking a box. Then I can connect it to this little leaflet and I can see little arrows. And there I get the information what I need in terms of actuators and sensors. And this is super important because I need to know what you wish for to know what kind of components I need. And then I can decide what kind of a system I need. Because it could be the case that the system from the store around the corner is just the best one and you can try it right away. Or maybe you wanted to pre pre prevention against breaking an entry, um, so you need an exterior movement sensor. Those are available with all smart systems, but there are very few um, that are actually um, enabled to work exterior. Most of them are just for the interior. So this pocket planner, I will make it available to you if you want to have a, have a look at it. Um, or visit us at our booth at the IFT. I'm going to be there later on as well, and tomorrow as well. And we also have the door hangers available, the pocket planners. So there are some things that you can take along. Right. So now I already talked about the questionnaire. This is what it looks like. You can download it free of charge from our website. So this gives you 48 questions. And once again, there's nothing that's scary, right? There is no technical term that you might need to know. It's just from the user's perspective, what a smart home would be able to do, just like a buffer. They could do it or they could not do it. And you need to tell them whether they should do it or not. 
And we also have a little card game that um, works just the same way. So we really gamified it and it's really a straightforward approach. You can just sort the cards to what you would like, what you wouldn't like. So we actually tried to make the beginning with smart home as easy possible without influencing the decision making process right without arguing in favor or against of something so this is our in, this is my interim conclusion i mean just approach the topic with an open mind and then form your own opinion and i find it quite shocking that some people uh, don't want to do that they say okay i'm just gonna outsource outsource this to some experts but how are they supposed to know what they're supposed to do if they don't know what you want I mean, it's just the same, like a butler, what they could do for you, but you don't tell them what you want. How are they supposed to do their proper job? You need to tell either a person or the system when and where you want to have lights switched on or switched off, for example. On the website, we also have an Excel list. So here you have the questionnaire B1, B5, for example, it's about lighting. It is a very easily worded, accessible to the lay person. And you can do the same on the website. You can download an Excel list. It contains exactly the same thing, but the, the wording is a little bit more precise. And we did that um, because we said, okay, maybe you would like to use this document in a tendering process to specify what you need. So maybe those texts are a little bit too general and here it's a little bit more precise, a little bit more to the point. So if you're already familiar with the system that you can use this and in the Excel, you can have different columns where you can say, right, kitchen, living room, bathroom and the like. And this also works for office building, right? You have an individual office, you have a multiple person office, you have the canteen or the cafeteria. We use these Excel lists for several 10,000 square meter projects. So it really works and it's available free of charge as a download. Right, so this was the first block of my presentation. So how do you approach this topic? Right, so very briefly, trends. So what is happening in building automation? I mean, there are some technical trends and you should know about them, right? So those are a lot of great boxes. You can see the battery, you can see the center, the actuator. Here you have some pictures of what they look like. You have the twisted cable, so KMX. You could also use another technology. You have a bus-based system, temperature sensor, brightness sensor. You also have uh, push buttons. You have also normal buttons. So, and you can install them wherever you need um, and operate the system. If you would want to do something like this, for example, KMX, you can program it in such a way that if the presence sensor notifies you about that, then light is switched on. So both lights or just one, left, right, whatever you want, you can program it. However, if you program it, there is not that many tricky things that you can do, right? No many exceptions. It's just like, okay, somebody is present, do this. Somebody is doing that, do this. So, and if you want to visualize something, then you need a controller. And if you want to have if-then conditions that you can use for programming, then this becomes a little bit more sophisticated. You can also connect yourself to the internet. And people are always worried, well, I'm getting hacked. And then you could say, okay, I could just connect it to your LAN system, but make sure that it's not accessible from the outside. So I have a smart to, uh, home system, but I don't need external access. I know what the system is doing, so I don't need to communicate with my building while I'm here, for example, at the forum. So I have no external access, so I cannot be hacked. So the same is based on radio. You can work with radio. And then people say, okay, this is also, you have um, the issue with radio of electrosmog. And I know that it is uh, an important topic and we need to be sensitive to it, but this is not something we need to worry about here. Those are little radio buttons. They just communicate and send waves if you push them. I don't know how many times you do that, two, three times a day, but not all the time, right? 
and then you just have a teeny bitty impulse that is sent. It's fairly measurable, the electromagnetic magnetic impulse. So please do not worry about electrosmog. So radio radio systems, when it comes to smart home, there's a, those are just impulses. If you were to measure your smartphone and its radiation, even if it is on um, in, in airplane mode, it's crazy. And now my mobile data is switched off, Bluetooth is switched off. If you were to measure it, then you were, would be really shocked. You would want to keep it away as far as possible. The same is like network adapters for smartphones, for example. A lot of students have them with them because they always use their smartphones for uh, also as an alarm clock. This is the crazy radiation. I mean, this, those are field strengths. It really blows your mind. If, and I will not talk about electrosmog and will not have a lecture on that as well. But please do not worry about those systems. And I mean, there are other, other sources of electrosmog that are significantly more harmful. Right, now we're talking about. Oh, we're now going to go back. If you want to dim light, then of course you can also adjust that to the presence of a person or something, things like that. Here I can have very easy connections, very easy rules. So I can have a direct connection between actuator and sensor, but those are very easy, uh, easy, uh, easy rules that you can implement. And then you can make it more complex once again by assembling more rules, by connecting it to the internet. You can just decide whatever you want to do. You can also just connect it to an intranet, like it really depends. So there are some systems, they wouldn't work without access to the internet. And there were systems that would um, would work without access. So you really need to select properly uh, depending on what you want. Right, then we have decentralized control via radio and then you have software-based solution and then you have the actual building automation where you have controllers. This is called central automation because you have a central controller. Everything is wired to that controller. This is not ideal if you have to lay all the cables. So those controllers are supported uh, or are radio-based and then they support further both systems and of course additional systems such as KNX. We already talked about that. So but these controllers are not only supporting KNX or both systems but they support a plethora as well as cable connections and this is what it looks like. And then you have to install them in your distribution box. Some, things, some people are shocked by that because they think it's too complex. But you just need to have a proper system and this is not something that you would use in your own home, right? So maybe such systems might be of an advantage because they are wireless, you can install them wherever you want them without them being visually disturbing. But once again, they have their limits as well. It would be wrong for you to take away that the one is better than the other. This is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that with the one, I can do more than with the other. But whether this is good or not, that is something I know once you fill in the questionnaire. Because then I can decide which system is the best for you. Right. So once again, there are so many technologies and they're Lobbyist telling you, right, this is um, uh, our, my best system, but this is not what's relevant. You need to define what you want, um, and then you can see uh, what system works for you. And we also have basically the Ten Commandments for proper uh, automation. So I can tell that I have actually stretched our schedule a little bit. I hope that uh, you are still with us. Perhaps it's the. Uh, I can I can just promise that this is the last thing that I will talk about, and I'm going to show you a little bit. I will not enlarge on every single aspect, but I can show you the links where you can download everything that I will be talking about, at least the highlights. So you should know that. I mean, of course, you know that there is something like a sort of certificate for the energy. Consumption. The background for the new German building energy law is the directive, the European Performance of Buildings Directive. This is the background of it all. 
namely this is for the entire building not stretched across windows and doors and so forth but it is about the buildings in general one of the versions has actually was enacted in 2018 that has actually not yet been implemented by the renewable energy side and if you look into the e PBD 2018, and I've actually highlighted what is most interesting about it, you will be very astounded to see everything about automation, monitoring, digitization, smart connection of e-mobility. So a lot of the topics have to do with digitization and communication. And for all of you, even if your focus is on facades and Well, I have the feeling that digitization should also be something that you in the facade technology are affected by. So in this EU directive, there are a lot of things that need to be implemented in the future. And of course, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the trend is brand all the time and you don't have to do everything that comes along, but you should at least have an opinion or a, a, a strategy, an alternative strategy. So this is why it is good to know what is written in this EPBD directive and where the trend is heading to. And I just try to put all of that together and hope that this will be helpful. In order to calculate the, the energy consumption, there is the DIN standard V18599, the part 11 that looks into building automation. And this is based on the standard EN 15232. And this is a great standard because they only look at automation as a topic. And they just uh, try to find out the level of automation. And this is where the 20% are coming from for an average office building. These are the highlights of the EPBD 2018. If you want, of course, you can read that, but perhaps you can just pick out the bulk the digitization of the building sector, smart connection of e-mobility, charging station, installation of self-regulating units and devices, monitoring and intelligence ability indicator okay are you in favor before you decide pro or con perhaps you have to figure out how difficult it is to achieve and then you can decide whether to follow it or not funnily enough the epbd 2018 has not yet been implemented by the german building energy act so it has not yet been implemented in germany and there already is an amendment, a revised version of the EPBD. And here you can see that building automation will become mandatory in non-residential buildings. And for residential building, it reads that as of 2025, there should be efficient monitoring and controlling functions. So it does not explicitly read smart home, but this is actually what it is. And if we look into it in more detail, we have a look at the Building Energy Act, for instance, the old energy savings ordinance, and they have actually based all of that on the EPBD 2010. So they started discussing the implementation of the EPBD 2010. And in the meantime, they have actually put into force the EPBD 2018. So you can see that there are some discrepancies regarding the content of the EPBD 2018, which is currently being revised again. So there is a lot of room for activities and for improvement. And as I said, there will be a new uh, Building Energy Act 2023, GAG 2023. This was only just approved by the federal government. And they have, for instance, reduced the primary energy need from 75 to 55. It is not 20, I think it is 23% of reduction. 23% less energy need per year. And it was actually planned that insulation needs to be improved significantly in order to address the stricter requirements regarding the insulation. And these stricter regulations have now been eliminated again and now people are trying to discuss whether this made sense or not and i hear people and colleagues say that it is a pity that they eliminated this part and i actually find that great because from my point of view and my heart really beats for automation this is opening a new perspective because this reduction from 75 to 55 should not only be done with insulation but also with automation 
And I mean, at the moment, you can decide whether you would like to go for one or the other aspect or whether you somehow uh, take a look at that in house. If, for instance, they said insulation should be reduced by 33% as well, then they would not provide would not have provided any leeway. I personally like that. I think it's good. But there are other esteemed colleagues who are not of my opinion. To wrap it up here, the EN15232. The EN15232 is a great standard where you can actually have an evaluation of the automation level of your building with a checklist if you know what a heating unit is, what a ventilation unit is, what is a facade and so forth. You should actually know all of that. Then there are individual categories, A, B, C, D. And here you can actually derive certain measures that make sense. And if you want to, I can show you how to do it. This is only the original expert from the EN standard 15232 regarding the individual regulations and regarding the heat pumps. And of course, they differentiate between residentials and non-residentials, and then you see the level of automation. Here, there are also some questions regarding the facade, in particular, with respect to shading. Again, it's a very simple questionnaire to fill in. And on our website, we do have a download template. Here you can see a file that in the left side, on the left hand side only shows the standard EN three two and um, we've just tried to provide it in an easier language. We have used a color code instead of those ticked off boxes or the crosses, and this is something that is available for you free of charge. So on the left hand side or rather on the right hand side from your point of view, there is the text that should be part in every RFQ if you want to back up some of your items. If for instance, I say, okay, the pump, I would like to have a pump in according with EN 15232, question six, third point. Nobody will understand that. You have to provide the full text, and here is the full text. And this file is available on our website in Excel format. You can download it. You can take these text templates if you want. As I said, the environmental pump is also part of that, and this is also available for facades. And you can see that there are like 48 or 49 questions in this checklist, and with that, you can actually describe the whole building. And if I mean, you don't even need to be an automation expert. If you see that you cannot tick off all of the boxes, you will know that there is room for improvement. Well, as you can see, you can completely screen your building very easily, very briefly, and try to find out whether there's anything that needs to be done. And then at the end of the day, there is the question, how much energy do I save with my environment pumps? And again, we are providing a free tool for that. This is what it looks like. You start on the website. You don't have to log in or create an account. You are just starting with those checklists or questionnaires. There are some questions, for instance, regarding shading and also the blinds. And when it comes to heating, they will also ask for the environment friends it comes and then you get an assessment or analysis and then you can start with a variant and perhaps it will end up on a different in a different range and then you can play with different scenarios and try to see what is in for you if you change some things and then you can see how much can be saved if, for instance, you have a typical C building and you would like to go to B, it is the 20%. That's quite accurate. We have actually carried out comprehensive studies in order to see whether everything provided by the study is true. As I said, you don't need to create an account. You can just store it locally. You can upload that. And due to the fact that we really work a lot with this standard and we really like it and because it helps us scanning our buildings to see how much energy can be saved. Okay, so I think this should be it as a highlight. Perhaps uh, some small insight what else we do as an institution. We do further trainings. We have uh, also those prospects over there at the booth of the IFT. And we also have uh, some 
consultancy and so forth also in order to accompany project development of individual companies. And what we also do is uh, trying to check to what extent you are subject to subsidization, so particularly with a focus on automation. Then over there at the IFT booth, we have fact sheets, takeaway fact, fact sheets, uh, wonderful brochures, just summarizing the highlights on these five topics, namely market development, the trend study, the protocols, the 10 commands, and to what extent automation, particularly building automation, uh, qualifies for subsidies. So please visit us at the booth and take it with you. And here again, I can show you our website. We have a blog with a recommendation of the month where we try to introduce the current trends. Here my contact data, please feel free to reach out to me also by calling my secretary or perhaps the Institute. I mean, it's very difficult uh, to reach me, but I will even give you my mobile phone number Look at that. This is my private telephone number. And if you still cannot reach me, I'm going to give you some other telephone numbers. My bakery shop, discounter, hairdresser, and also the gas station. No, I'm just kidding. Here, of course, we have a whole plethora of email addresses. No, this is my real business card. Please feel free to reach out to me. Here is the link to the website where you can also download the presentation of today but uh, it's best if you just step by or try to establish contact over Xing or LinkedIn and I have those pocket planners please feel free to get hold of them thank you for your attention